what happens on the boundary of M. And if we get to it, I will discuss it. But for the moment, let's not consider it. Okay, so we could say that just as ordinary operators, O is mapped to O prime, and O prime is a linear combination of operators. So let me edit here, O prime equals that, and O prime is some sum over the operators with O, J, this is I, J, this is I, this is I, J, I. So if I have an operator O, I, it is mapped to R, I, J of the group element O, J. We had that formula in the first lecture. So the same is true here, except that O is supported on higher dimensional manifolds. And again, if the symmetry is continuous, it's a billion. So it could be UN, U1, or it could be U1, or it could be a, a cyclic group, ZN, or products of them, etc. But if it is U1, it, in case it's U1, then U can again be written as e to the i, an integral over m, of some j. The same thing is in with the zero form symmetry. So what, are, what is all this good for? This is kind of a very abstract thing here on this blackboard. And I'll put it up there for the time being. So that looks like just doing formalism for the sake of formalism. But the point is that anything you can do with ordinary symmetries, you can do again. So for example, the first thing you do with ordinary symmetries is that it gives you selection rules on amplitudes. So you, amp and you want to compute an amplitude, and you have a bunch of operators, and sometimes it's zero just because the amplitude violates the symmetry. And the way to say that is that you take the symmetry operator, you try to break it through all the operators, right? So you have, if you have a cat and a bra, put the symmetry operator, say, annihilates the vacuum, and then, or gives one on the vacuum, and then you bring it through all the operators, you transform all the operators, and then it gives one on the end. And as a result, you get a selection rule that the, the operators have to be invariant under the symmetry. This is completely standard. And you can do the same thing here. And I will soon give examples. Yeah. Uh, it will not be a one form. It will be a different form. Well, it, uh, depending on what Q is. If Q is a zero form, then the current is a is a d minus is a d minus one form, and as q is getting bigger, the dimensionality of m is getting smaller, and the and the, the degree of the, the form is getting. So the terminology is kind of confusing because there's one integer q, and sometimes it's better to call zero the ordinary symmetry. Sometimes it's better to go backwards because as you vary q the dimensionality of the symmetry operator changes, but also the dimensionality of the charged operators. Not the charge operator, but the charged operators varies. And the convention we adopt here is that Q is the dimensionality of the charged operators. So local operators is Q equals zero when they are the charge one. Uh, lines are Q equals one, et cetera. And if we have a symmetry, we can have now twisted boundary conditions. So class, coupling to classical background fields, we can gauge the symmetry. And when we gauge the symmetry, new parameters enter a various discrete data parameters for the expert in the audience, I would say. It's like gauging an ordinary discrete symmetry in one plus one dimensions. There's discrete torsion that can be added, which tells you how to sum over the, the various sectors. And the symmetry could be spontaneously broken. We'll discuss it soon in detail. And there could be anomalies. So I prepared here eight examples and we'll go through the eight examples. And depending on the time, we'll go through all of them or some of them. They are, every one of them uh, has something interesting in it. And that's why I picked it. And they're kind of in a monotonically degree of sophistication. And we'll do it twice. 
First, we'll discuss the kinematics, and then we'll discuss the dynamics. The kinematics is what's the theory, what's the symmetry? And we'll just understand what the symmetry is, we'll sign the group and see what the charge objects are, et cetera. The dynamics will involve more details like what's the Hamiltonian? What is the long distance behavior? Uh, how can the symmetry help us constrain the long distance behavior of the system? So I'm moving to example number one. So this would be example number one. And the example is U1 gauge theory. So the first few examples will be free field theories. And they will demonstrate clearly what I said before that using symmetries in this case, or especially these generalized symmetries is clearly overkill because the symmetry, the theory is completely solvable. So why do I bother with these symmetries? But that's good kind of to align our conventions and our understanding. So it, the first example would be three plus one dimension, U1 gauge theory. And, and here the one form symmetry, there are two one form symmetries. Two one form symmetries. And you will soon see that this is something that you're very well familiar with, except the fancy name where one form symmetry. If it's a one form symmetry, it should be associated with a surface. So we have a surface. So the operator is supported on the surface, not on all of space, but on the surface. The surface could act at a given time or would have one of its direction along time and the other direction along space. And symmetry is U1, two U1 symmetries. And since it's continuous, there is a current. Since it's continuous symmetry, there is a current. And the current can be exponentiated the way I said here. So we need to find a current in Maxwell theory. And there are two currents. There is F and star F. This is Maxwell theory without sources. So one current would be two over G squared in my conventions times star F, and the other is one over two pi F. And we refer to this symmetry as a magnetic symmetry, one form symmetry. And this would be, any guesses? Nobody knows the answer electric one form symmetry. And if we integrate it over a surface, what is it known in plain English? Integrating the magnetic field through a surface. It's the flux, the magnetic flux. And if we integrate this one, it's the electric flux. So the symmetry operator is the electric flux or the magnetic flux through the surface. And we can also always ask, how does it act on various things? Symmetry operator acts. So it can be, when I say it measures the flux, that's a measurement, but we could ask, how does it act on the fields? And so, uh, the electric flux is typically protected from the charge inside the surface. Yep, that's correct. So are these two things the same? Yes, in a way that I will soon explain. Sorry? The charge? Uh, no. The thing which is related to a zero form symmetry is the gauge charge, which is not meaningful because it's not gauge invariant. So I'm very careful to use a formulation where I never discuss the gauge symmetry. So I'm only interested in gauge invariant quantities. So what is normally called charge is the electric charge inside. That's not gay. It, it, it's true, but I cannot have all the, the charge there. I have to be, to be, it will end up being the same, but I'll use a language which is more precise, which will allow me to generalize to other cases. So you're completely right that if I have electric charges, then the surface measures the total electric charge inside. But these electric charges are, say, electrons inside. They're not gauge invariant. To make them gauge invariant, we need to attach them to Wilson lines. And then this thing will actually measure the Wilson lines. 
So it, this will give you a more precise way of dealing with, so it's very confusing, especially so if they use, people here are interested in QCD. In QCD, this notion of the color charge is very confusing because of it's strongly interacting and the, how do we define the, the total flux, the, the total flux or the total charge and it's not gauge invariant. And we can give a whole lecture of which we, this thing is perfectly meaningful. So how does the symmetry act? We just have to compute the commutation relations of this with anything. So I'll temporarily use a gauge non-invariant thing. So the electric symmetry, this one, shifts A, the vector potential by C, and C is a flat U1 gauge field. For example, it could be a constant. So here is the symmetry, right? F mu nu square, and wherever you see A2, shift it to A2 plus 3.4. That's clearly a symmetry of Maxwell theory. And it's non-trivial symmetry because it's not a gauge transformation. So if there'd been a gauge transformation, you would say, oh, but I can undo it with a gauge transformation. I cannot undo it with a gauge transformation. So that's what the electric symmetry does. The magnetic symmetry does not act in a simple way on A, but if you perform a duality transformation and you describe the gauge theory, same Maxwell theory, using not the photon A, not the photon field A, but another field like the magnetic photon, then this one shifts the magnetic, fo ma the magnetic photon by a constant. So let, now let me write the operator like to exponentiate things. So the operator U is labeled by, so the symmetry is U1 times U1. So it's labeled by the electric symmetry, which would be E to the I alpha and the magnetic symmetry, which would be E to the I eta. And they both depend on M. And this is E to the I eta over two pi integral of F plus two I alpha over G square integral of star F. And these things have various names. Uh, the closest is, it's a surface operator. It depends on the surface that we integrate over. And the closest in this context is what is known as gukov witten operators. And what are the charged objects? So in this case, I don't even have to answer your question because we're doing the pure gauge theory. There are no charges in the problem. But we could, we could still have these uh, uh, charges. We don't have electric charges, but we, uh, the zero form gauge electric charges, but they could be charged objects under these. And these are Wilson lines and the Toft lines. So a Wilson line on a line L would charge N and the Toft line would charge M on L can multiply them together. So here is a line L, line L, and we can surround it by a two surface M. And if we compute, we compare these lines with and without the surface operator, we can measure the electric and the magnetic charges of the Wilson and the Atwood lines respectively. So this is the same as what you normally do when you have a point operator, the operator transforms under some U1 symmetry and you surround it by co-dimension one manifold in space time and you compare with and without it. And that tells you the charge of the operator. Here, the charged object is a line. Let me give another example, which would be example two just to demonstrate things. So I erase this. Let me be in, in two plus one dimension. So here you could say, what am I, why am I bothering you? Because you learned about Maxwell theory in high school and you knew that there's electric and magnetic flux. And I managed to say it here in a very confused perhaps way. So why am I telling you about all that? So I'll take, take an example which is slightly more interesting, still a free field theory. So this is example number two. I'm in two plus one dimensions. 
I still have a U1 gauge theory, but I'm taking a trans Simons theory. So I'm writing A dA, this is the Lagrangian, N over four pi. This is a trans, U1 trans Simons theory. And the notion of charge is now a little bit more complicated. And just saying what charges we have might not, you will not be able to get away with it. But there is a one form symmetry here. And we can, because we can shift A by a constant. We can still perform the same transformation and shift A by a constant. And as we do that, this Lagrangian or this action is not gauge invariant. To be gauge invariant, the periods of Xi have to be appropriate. So what we can do is shift A goes to A plus one over N epsilon with epsilon is a flat one gauge field. Yeah with integer periods. And consequently, the symmetry is Zn. So now we can go through the same thing again. This is an electric symmetry, and therefore the charged objects are lines, and the lines carry electric charge, and what we call the electric charge of the line is how it transforms under the one form symmetry. In this case, it's a ZN transformation. Now, if you look at the equation of motion of A and you have a source, you'll see that the magnetic field is a delta function on the source, right? That's the equation of motion. And consequently, if you have a line, so we are in two plus one dimensions, say this is space and this is time, and I'm going around this line this way, I get a holonomy in the gate symmetry depending on the charge that I put in the middle. And that means that the charge operator is also, the charge operator is the Wilson line and the Wilson lines themselves are also charged under the symmetry. So in the previous example, the charged operators were surfaces and the charged operators were the lines, Wilson and the Hooke lines. In this example, the, charge, the charges are lines, Wilson lines. There are N of them. The symmetry group is Zn. And the charged operators are also the lines. So we already see here something I'm using that the charge operator is itself charged under the symmetry. We have a Zn symmetry and the charge operator is it in self charged. So the symmetry is still abelian. When I compose these lines, they compose in an abelian way. But if I have one of them and I go around it, I pick a phase. That is the statement that this DN symmetry has an anomaly and therefore I cannot gauge it. The statement of an anomaly in this, one, in this case is that the charged objects, the charges, are themselves charged under the symmetry. One way to think about it is, is what does it mean to gauge the symmetry? Gauging the symmetry is throwing in lots and lots of charge operators, right? We, we would like to have transition function. We have bundles and transition functions and so forth. So I draw, I said, trying to gauge a symmetry means that this is my space time and I'm going to sum all the configurations where these lines are everywhere. But these lines are now charged under the others. So if I start summing over these, I'm going to get zero, which is characteristic of a system which is anomalous if I try to gauge too much. Now, various subgroups of this would be anomaly free. What's the role of the trans Simon? That's the Lagrangian. Yeah, but We've been zero or just F square? Ah, excellent question. So imagine, so this would be example 1.5, two plus one D, F square, no trans Simon's term. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay, so that would be very easy compared, given what we've done there. There's a one form 
the one's electric symmetry. The same as before, the electric flux. But the magnetic flux will now be a zero form symmetry. Indeed, if you study a Maxwell theory in two plus one dimensions, there's the monopole number is a conserved charge and the charged particles are, it's a zero form symmetry. So the charged objects are point operators. These are called monopole operators. And yeah, that's what it is. But now when we add the Chern simons term, you see this is gone. And this goes to a subgroup. Zn, and furthermore, the charged objects are the charges the, are themselves the same as the charged objects. So since we discussed example one point five, I'm going to skip one example for the sake of time, because I'm really behind. Question. No, no, it could be it could be much more complicated. And I gave that here as an example because it I didn't need to do more work to, to study. But yeah, it could be much more complicated. And even this classification uh, can be refined further because symmetries with different cues could mix together. That's known a two group or a three group. And you know, that's a common thing in physics. Whenever you understand something. It can be generalized, and some of the things you learn need to be extended. Okay, example four. I'm keeping track of the number to match. If I have time, I will fill in the gaps. So take the example above, three plus one B, U1 gauge theory, with a scalar field with charge. So what's the symmetry? So we just look around and say, what, what can we still do? For the magnetic symmetry, it's the same because magnetic F is still a conserved charge. So we still have a U1, one form magnetic symmetry. But the existence of charge and particles, dynamical charge and particles means that the electric symmetry is broken. Because we said the electric symmetry, we try to shift the gauge field by a flat gauge field. And if we, the kinetic term for the scalar fields is not invariant, unless we shift it by something that is n times the basic unit. And therefore, the symmetry is only a Zn one form electric symmetry. Let me say it more physically. What are the charged objects? The charged objects under the electric symmetry are Wilson lines. And the Wilson lines carry an integer. What charge we have? We have e to the i and integer times a. Right, that's the Wilson line. But the theory has dynamical scalar fields we charge in. So I can start with a, a line operator that has charge seven and pop out of the vacuum a pair of scalar fields with charge n and minus n, attach one of them to the line and send the other one very far. So we see that the line operator with charge one and the line operator with charge eight are not distinguishable because there could be transitions between them. So being non-distinguishable is too strong, but using the symmetries, I cannot distinguish between them. Similarly, I can go from one to minus six in that case. So all in all, the electric symmetry becomes discrete. And that will soon have uh, consequences. Yeah. 
Example number five is the subject of this score. Three plus one, the SUN gauge theory with no quarks. Let's just do this one. Now claim that we have a ZN electric one form symmetry. We can shift the gauge field by a flat ZN connection. And since you studied the theory on the lattice, let me tell you what it means on the lattice. Take any lattice configurations where on every link we put an SUN matrix. That's a configuration in the path integral. And I can multiply each link by e to the two pi i over n times the unit matrix. This is also an SUN matrix. So I mapped every, every configuration of links, I mapped to another one. And I'm only restricting it such that the plaquettes do not change. So the plaquettes do not change. So this is a constraint and I work modulo gauge transformation. So what I really do is multiply the gauge fields by a ZN gauge field. The only thing that matters is what the total holonomy of what I multiplied around the various cycles. So that's a symmetry. And the charged objects are the Wilson lines. And then it will be very similar to the exam example number four. A priori, the Wilson lines are labeled by, by what? What's the label of a Wilson line? The representation of SUN, but I don't have quarks, but I have gluons. So I can attach a gluon to the line and change the representation. The only thing that remains invariant is the analyty or the ZN charge of the Wilson line. And this electric one form symmetry is a way of saying that I'm interested in the analyty of the Wilson line. So if I'm doing say QCD, I know it is in the three, or it could be in the three bar. And it could also be the same as the six, but the six is the same as three bar. So I don't, I don't have to count it separately. So there are only three classes of lines, the trivial one, the one in the three, and the one in the three bar, and all the others can be obtained by multiplying them by the eight. And there is no magnetic symmetry. In fact, this theory doesn't have a truth operators. The SUN gauge theory does not have an truth operator. If we try to create an truth operator, we we'll see that we'll have to attach it to a surface. So it's not a genuine line operator. So no truth operators. Line operators. And no magnetic symmetry. So the only thing that we are left with is the ZN electric one form symmetry. Now, some people like to refer to this symmetry as a center symmetry. I'm sure you came across that name. I think this is extremely misleading. It's extremely misleading for several reasons. First of all, let's go back to example number one. The group was U1, the center is U1, and you can think of the electric U1 one form symmetry as being the center, associated with the center of the group. But what about the magnetic one form symmetry? It's not associated with the center of U1. It is associated with the center. If we dualize the theory, write it in terms of magnetic variables, then it's the, the associated with the center of the gauge group. But the gauge symmetry is not really there. So we should really be thinking about this symmetry is an intrinsic object independent of which variables we use to formulate the theory. And therefore, we don't want to think about it as associated with the center. I will soon make this point a lot stronger. So a line operator is this one, supported on a line. That's a genuine line operator. I don't care what's going on here. Now, some line operators make sense only if they are the boundary of a surface and things could depend on what happens with the surface. Example, 
in the icing model, have you studied the icing model? So there's a line operator and a dis, uh, there's an odor operator and a disorder operator. In the standard convention, the odor operator is a, is a point operator and the disorder operator is attached to a line and you have to keep track of the line. So in this terminology, if the icing operator is a genuine point operator, the disorder operator is not because it is attached to a line. And take this statement and bump it up in dimensions. The Wilson line is a line and the Atuft line is not a line. We'll soon reverse that statement. Example six will be relatively easy. This is really the topic of this theory, of this school, SUN, with quarks, quarks in N, in the fundamental representation. So we've already done the same thing with the, in the abelian case. So in the abelian case, we saw the magnetic symmetry was not affected by adding the matter fields but the electric symmetry was violated and we got a subgroup. What we have here is the magnetic symmetry wasn't there in to begin with. So there's still no magnetic symmetry. Symmetry. And the electric symmetry was Zn, but the quarks are in the fundamental representation. They can screen it. And therefore there is no electric symmetry. So this problem as it stands does not have any one form global symmetry. Now, if the quarks are very heavy and we send their mass to infinity, we get an approximate one form symmetry at low energies. If you're studying this problem at large n, the, n, the quarks do not participate in any process inside of no dynamical quarks. And then again, we have a one form symmetry. And we had a discussion of that in the discussion session. Something I will soon say, as a result of that, in QCD as it stands, there is no clear notion of confinement because the Wilson line can always be screened by quarks. QCD with very massive quarks or QCD at large N does have this notion of confinement because we're going to recover this ZN one form symmetry. And I really cannot resist putting example seven here. Three plus one B, the gate group is PSUN, which is the same as SUN mod ZN. And what that means is that the, the gate group in saying SU3 is not SU3, but PSU3 which means that we have more possible bundles, bundles where the transition functions close in PSU3, but not in SU3. And we can think of it as gauging the ZN one form symmetry of example five. So we gauge the, the one form symmetry. And as a rule, whenever you have a symmetry and you gauge it, after you gauge it, the symmetry is gone because gauging means that you're only interested in the invariant operators. So after we gauge the ZN, the ZN is gone. In fact, in this theory, I cannot even add the quarks. I cannot add the quarks because they are not in a representation of PSUN. The representations of PSUN do not include anything that transforms under the center. However, we get some new bonuses here. And that's common that whenever we gauge a symmetry, we can get a new symmetry as a gift. We lose symmetries because we gauge it, so it's no longer there, but we normally get a new symmetry back. If you studied all in two dimensions, 
Oberfolds can be thought of as gauging a symmetry. In that case, it's a zero form symmetry. And after you've done that, you keep only the invariant states, but you get a quantum symmetry that acts on the twisted sector. And that's how you get a new symmetry. As a result, we have here a one form Zn magnetic symmetry. So when I objected to using the notion of the center of the, of the notion of a center symmetry, this really drives it home because here the gauge group is PSUN. There is no center in PSUN. It's a group that doesn't have a center. And consequently, it doesn't have an electric one form symmetry. But the theory still has a magnetic one form symmetry, which is this magnetic one. Yes. Ah. B, it comes from the fact, uh, are you familiar with Oberfolds? Yes, so when you have an Oberfold in two dimensions, you take a, a parent theory and you gauge some discrete symmetry. So step one, you throw away all the states that are not invariant. By doing that, you lost the symmetry you started with. But you have to introduce twisted sectors. And there is a symmetry that acts on the twisted sectors. For a billion Oberfolds, it's a set, is a group, it's the same as the original one. If it's non abelian, it's a little bit more complicated. This is the same thing, but for higher form symmetry. There was an electric ZN symmetry, one form symmetry. We gauged it to find the PSUN theory. By doing that, we got rid of anything that transforms under the symmetry. All the Wilson lines are gone. The Wilson lines are no longer good operators. They're projected out. But we have twisted sectors. And the twisted sectors transform under this magnetic ZN symmetry. If I have time, I will say more about that. So there's a magnetic flux. There are new operators, twisted operators, the toothed lines. In this case, I said that there are no toothed lines because they have to be attached to a surface, but the same guys are now good line operators and they carry charge under the magnetic symmetry. And finally, I want to give example number eight. And that's a CPN model in any number of dimensions. So that's a nonlinear sigma model. The target space is a manifold CPN. Who doesn't know what CPN is? Who does know what CPN is? Great. So this is a manifold. And we're just doing a sigma model whose target space is this manifold. A simple case is n equals one, and this is known as the O3 sigma model, which is a very famous model. If we are in one plus one dimensions, this is a sigma model, it's renormalizable, it can be underlined, in fact, it can even be solved exactly. It's a beautiful model. And among other things, it has instantons, where space time is wraps the S2. That's true for any CPN. CPN is non-trivial to cycle and we have instantons. If we do the same thing in two plus one dimension, we have non-trivial maps from space time, sorry, from space to the target space, and they are called skirmions. So this model in two plus one dimension has skirmions, and these are particles charged under that symmetry. And if we study this model in three plus one dimensions, and we use the same map, we have strings. So in three plus one dimensions, We have strings. We take the xy plane and we wrap it around a two cycle in CPN. So that's a configuration. It's a soliton in the theory. And the configuration is independent of time. So it just sits there, but it's also independent of z. And therefore, this thing exists at every z. So this is a string lining in the z, running in the z direction at all times. So there are strings, and therefore, there is a one-form symmetry. The one-form symmetry is such that the strings are charged under it. So CPN has a Kelly form, and we can integrate it and find the charge. 
And again, I want to emphasize that there is no gauge field in the story. And since there's no gauge field, I can't say, aha, that's a center symmetry. Center of what, right? There's no center of anything because there's no gauge group. There is a formulation of the model where there is a gauge group and then it is indeed the center symmetry, but it's then indeed associated with the center of the group. But if I think of it as a nonlinear sigma model, there's no center and no gauge group. Okay, that's the end of the kinematics. Now, why did I tell you all that? We went through seven out of eight examples that I prepared. Every one of them is a different high form symmetry. All of them were one form symmetry. The example I skipped, there was also a two form symmetry. And I could say, I managed to say a lot of things that you already learned when you studied these systems. So you studied these systems and you learned about a proper, their properties. And every single fact I said was already there before, before I, before I introduce these generalized symmetries. So what is it good for? And it's really good for the dynamics. So ordinarily, when we have a symmetry and we know what the symmetry is, we can use it to control the dynamics. And one question we could ask, can the symmetry be spontaneously broken or not? So we would like to characterize phases of the system by saying, oh, in this phase, the symmetry is spontaneously broken. In the other phase, the symmetry is unbroken. That's a way of thinking about phases. The second thing we can get is selection rules. We have some configurations of operators and the answer might be zero because of the selection rule. Now, this will be a configuration of lines and there would be a selection rule on the, on the correlation function of the lines. And I'm not going to do it here, but the topic close to my heart is duality. You often have two different theories that appear to be different, but they're actually secretly the same theory. They say that they are dual to each other. We've seen an example of that in example number one, could use either the electric or the magnetic variables. The symmetry is an intrinsic property of the theory. It is independent of which degrees of freedom we use to describe it. And as such, it's, it's independent of which degrees of freedom we use. And therefore it should be the same. The, the global symmetry must be the same in both of them. So in the example of the U1 theory, we see I use the electric variables. You prefer to use the magnetic variables. That's perfectly fine. So we both say that symmetry is U1 times U1, but what you call electric, I call magnetic and vice versa. So the symmetry has to be the same in all dual frames. And that's a powerful check on dualities. So here they, we don't need that because we can just perform the duality transformation. But there are other more complicated examples where we cannot perform the duality transformation explicitly. And then we do need that as a powerful check. And it actually works in a, in some complicated examples, it works in a highly non-trivial way, giving us more confidence in the, in the duality. We can also twist the boundary conditions and have more observables in the theory. And I said that we can gauge the symmetry. And what I really wanna focus on is characterizing phases by the symmetry. So Landau taught us what is known as the Landau paradigm. We classify phases of matter by finding the symmetry, and then the symmetry could be spontaneously broken to various subgroups of the symmetry. That's the first order of characterization of phases. So the Ising model has two phases, the broken and the unbroken phase, known as the ordered and the disordered phase. There was a question here. I will never finish it. So. So, 
just as a group, SUN has a center in Seattle. And uh, as a group, CSUN, uh, it, it feels like it's really useful to support open source discussion. You've, you've, you've given it uh, a non trivial fundamental. Yes. In other words, you've, you've added a place where you can go from the identity and wrap around. I have um, symmetry associated with the fundamental itself, but the fundamental that I've kind of switched out for the center. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm curious why then, like, why, why can't I say, for example, I can just maybe just get a definition for this. That would be the case. As you want, it feels like I have the center, the electric symmetry, and I have the fundamental. That feels like a fundamental. Yeah, so in some cases it's unambiguous. In already in example one, the electric one is the center, the magnetic one is not. And in this example, there isn't even a gauge theory. In this example, there isn't even a gauge theory. So the center of what? And I think that actually the proper way to think about it is never to think about it as a center symmetry. Sometimes in special cases, you can it arises as a center symmetry. And historically, the first few examples appeared as a center symmetry. But in, I, I mentioned the examples of duality. In many duality examples, it's a center in one duality frame and it's not a center in another duality frame. So let me give you an example to really drive it home. Uh, you can consider in, instead of the gate group being SUN, you consider the gate group being spin N and the quarks be, still be in the vector representation. The electric one form symmetry is Z2 because the center of spin N is Z2, Z2 times Z2 or Z4, depending on N. But if we look at all, the, all those things that don't act on the vector, we are left with Z2. So the, the one form symmetry is Z2 and it is, can be thought of it as a center symmetry. Now the model becomes strongly coupled and what does it do in for at low energies? At low energies, it has some chiral symmetry. The chiral symmetry is spontaneously broken. And at long, at long distances, it's spontaneously broken. You write a nonlinear sigma model, which is roughly this CPN. And the one form symmetry microscopically, which was a center symmetry, becomes at long distances, this one form symmetry of the sigma model, which has no gauge field in it. So that's an example of how it's the same symmetry, but in one case it appeared as a center, associated with the center of the gauge group. In the other case, at low energies, there's no gauge group. And, and this is actually quite common. So when you this, if it's weakly coupled, you can say, oh, that's the gauge group, and that's what you see. And also in the PSUN, you cannot almost could get away with it. But once it becomes strongly coupled, and the symmetry is mixed together, uh, it, you cannot pinpoint whether it's a center or not. Well, I'm just warning a little bit for my, my ability to easily characterize things now because, of course, the question is still can I engage in this discussion? Is there a mathematical object that, would, that I could use? The one form symmetry. The one form symmetry is an intrinsic thing. I don't care how, whether you describe the theory using gauge fields or not, this gauge group or the other one, it doesn't matter. The theory could be weakly coupled, could be strongly coupled. The one form symmetry is there. And I gave a definition, I gave a definition. I would like to say a few words about symmetry breaking. What does it mean for a one form symmetry to be spontaneously broken or not? So I'll first give the answer and then I'll motivate it. A one form symmetry, which is spontaneously broken, corresponds to, to the line operators having perimeter law. So in the U1 gauge theory, the, we are in the Coulomb phase. The line, so if I make the loop very, very big, there's only a perimeter law which I can renormalize the way. So if I renormalize the perimeter law away, I would say the expectation value of a very big group, a very big line, 
is one in some units, it's a number. That's a VEV, think of it as a VEV, and therefore the symmetry is spontaneously broken. Another way of thinking about it, the symmetry acts by shifting the gauge field by a constant, and that's the typical behavior when the symmetry is spontaneously broken. And in the case of the photon, I could even say that the photon is the Goldstone boson of a spontaneously broken symmetry, a spontaneously broken one form symmetry. So putting all this together, whenever we have photons or a ZN gauge theory at long distances, we say that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. What does it mean that the symmetry is not spontaneously broken, that the symmetry is preserved? For ordinary symmetry, it means that there are particles in the spectrum and the symmetry classifies the particles, classify which charges they carry. Like the proton carries barrier number one, and we can say that because barrier number is not spontaneously broken. So here we need the one form symmetry, symmetry is not broken if there are strings in the spectrum. So the sign that this one form symmetry is not spontaneously broken or is unbroken is that there are strings in the spectrum. So the problem of confinement is first of all, study SUN, not SUN with matter, but SUN. So I can add parenthetically, do it at large n so you don't have to think about the quarks or make the quarks very heavy, or just study the pure n. It has a ZN one form symmetry. And the goal of this collaboration is to prove that this symmetry is unbroken. If the symmetry is unbroken, there are springs carrying the ZN charge. And the Wilson line has an area law, which is again the hallmark of a symmetry which is not spontaneously broken. For zero form symmetries, you look at the charge operator here, an operator carrying charge and another one here. And if the symmetry is unbroken and the spectrum is gapped, spectrum is gapped, the symmetry is unbroken, the correlation function decays exponentially and it becomes zero at long distances. That's a statement of the area law. When we have an area law, we make the loop bigger, the strings, the, we make the loop bigger and the expectation value is e to the minus the area. And that we think of as having strings and the coefficient of the area is the string tension. And this is the string that is charged under the symmetry. Any states, there's a Hilbert space and there are states and there could be X. What, what do you mean by one dimension to the way? A state means that energy is localized in some region and it could be at the point, could be localized on a line or could be localized on the surface. The first is known as a particle. The second is known as a string. And the third is called let's say domain wall or membrane. Right, right. So the object is a string, it's one dimensional, it sweeps a surface in space time. And the symmetry that we talk about is a one form symmetry. It is uh, measured by a surface. String breaking means that the symmetry was not there in the first place. It's the analog of explicit breaking. You know, a symmetry could be explicitly broken or spontaneously broken. Explicitly broken means that the symmetry is not really there. It might be an approximate symmetry. If a string breaks by popping pairs out of the vacuum, then we say that uh, the symmetry was not really there. If uh, the symmetry is spontaneously broken, there are no strings at all, but instead there must be something at low energies. So it could, in, in the case of 
QCD, if there are no, there's no confinement, we could just find gluons at low energies. Okay, the next of the plan for today, which we will do in the next minus one minute, one is one minute, yeah. So in the next minus one minute, we'll go through all these examples and see what all the phases are. And either we do it tomorrow or we'll switch to another topic tomorrow. One more L. What is the Sorry? The object that is, is this in, in how many dimensions? Oh, in the four dimensional example, there are strings. The CP1 model in four dimensions has strings where we take the XY plane. So imagine CP1, so the target space is S2. We take the XY plane and we wrap the S2. Sorry? Okay, I'm in three plus one dimensions. Okay, how many dimensions do you want to be in? Three plus one, great. So we're in three plus one, let's call them X, Y, Z, and T. So get Z and T for a second. So look at the function in the X, Y plane, we wrap the target space, which is S2. That's, a config that's my configuration. And if I'd been just in two dimensions, I would say it carries winding charge one or it has a discharge when I integrate omega H1. I take it to be independent of time and independent of Z. Independent of time means it just sits there, it's a static configuration. Independent of Z means that I repeat it at every value of Z. And therefore I have a string running along the Z direction. And the way to see the charge of the string is integrate that surface on the XY plane. So the charge particle or the charge object is not a particle, it is a string. In this, in this example, it is stretched along the Z direction. Sorry? It's independent of T, so it just sits there. It's a stable string. It's a solid tone. It's not any different than the strings of QCD. The strings of QCD are exactly the same. There's a flux tube going along the Z direction at all times. So, but the same thing is true for, for QCD strings. Oh, okay. First of all, I, I, let's make one thing easy. Whatever you say about QCD strings, so let's assume you proved confinement. SUN gauge theory has strings. That means that the one form symmetry is unbroken. The same thing is true in the CP1 model, except that in the CP1, we know the answer. That's the answer. It, uh, the one form symmetry is unbroken and it has strings. Now you ask me a separate question. What does it have to do with all the wrapping and stuff of the charge? That works very well for the operators that create them, not for the states. I hope I answered the question. Now, if you have any more questions, I'm around and feel free to come and talk to me. Are we done? Okay.